Hello, Great Clacton, and welcome back to Ask a Pastor. It's good to be back uh, doing these videos with you. And I want to start tonight by talking about what might be my favorite subject other than uh, faith, which is uh, Middle Earth, uh, J.R. Tolkien's writings, which this might not surprise you if you've listened to any of, the, any of my other videos, because I bring it up very often. Now, during his lifetime, Tolkien completed three books about Middle-earth. First one, The Hobbit, then his masterpiece, Lord of the Rings, and then The Silmarillion. He didn't actually finish that during his lifetime. He, his son had to sort of finish it up because uh, he died before it was completed, but it was near enough that it sort of counts as being official. So these are the three books that make up all of the official writings uh, by Tolkien about Middle-earth. But for people like me who tend to get you know really interested and, and obsessed and geeky about things like this, there's so much more to read than just these books. For example, there is a book of of unfinished tales, as well as a book of lost tales, a second book of lost tales, and these are just half of a 12 volume set that um, are all background information to the writings about Middle Earth. They are alternate versions of stories or works in progress, things that were never finished. And for anyone that is interested in Middle-earth, this is it's just a wealth of knowledge. But it's way too much for someone who just sort of wants to read what are the stories of Middle-earth that Tolkien wrote. This is all you need for that. So unless you're obsessive, you don't really need to, to bother yourself with this stack of books or anything like that. And the reason I bring that up is because... I want to talk about the, how the, the books of the Bible were put together. Why we have certain books in the Bible and not others. Now, before Lent, the last video I did before we took a, a break for the, the Lent period, I talked about how we came to have the books in the New Testament. And today I want to talk about how it is that we came to have the books in the Old Testament. And to, before we start to do that, I, I want to talk about a word which you may have heard in, um, in sort of a church context. It's actually used a lot in sort of geek culture nowadays as well, and that is the word canon. That if you, if you talk about uh, sort of geek culture, you have the, the canon of Tolkien's works would be these three books. That is, these are the official story uh, this is what happened, you know, for real, in his world. Uh, the same thing with uh, Star Wars, which is a, a love-hate relationship, where the canon of Star Wars is the group of stories that's meant to be the real story of what happens in the Star Wars universe. But that actually keeps changing. That, um, well, I won't get into the details to, to bore you, but especially once Disney took over Star Wars, they decided, well, some of the things that were official canon, they're not anymore, but these films and TV series that we're doing now, that's definitely the real story. So that's how it's used in geek culture, to talk about what the real story is in a made-up uh, property. When we talk about the canon of the Bible, it's actually a much more profound uh, meaning, because we're talking about not sort of what is the official version of a made-up story, but we're talking about which are the books in the Bible, or really, you know, we've chosen the books in the Bible because they are canon. That means because people have believed strongly that the books that, they, that were gathered together in what we call the Bible were all inspired by God. And... That's actually a very, very serious thing uh, to claim, but that's the heart of 
why we have the Bible that we have today. It's because throughout the, the millennia and the centuries, people have believed very strongly and really come to an overall group consensus that it's these books that have ended up in the Bible. These are the writings that were inspired by God. And what does that mean, though, when we talk about in being inspired by God? Because it, it doesn't take away the human element. That God very purposefully used humans with different gifts and personalities and backgrounds and cultures to, as its instruments for revealing the truth about himself to people. And so that's why you could have something like the book of um, the books of Kings, which are very similar in content to the books of Chronicles, but they're actually written differently with, for, with a different scope. That's why you can have four Gospels, each of which, even though they tell the same true story of Jesus' life, tell the events of Jesus' life in, from a different perspective, with a different emphasis on what's really, really important. It's almost like, uh, the way I like to think about how uh, God inspired individuals to, pl to write the books of the Bible is thinking about different musical instruments playing the same tune. That you could play um, For Elise, one of my, my son's favourite songs to play on the piano. You can play it on the piano and it sounds one way, but you could take that same song and play it um, on a trumpet, or on a harmonica, on something else, and even though it's the same song, it's going to sound different, but it's still the same song. It's recognizable as being the same song. And that is how I believe God used people to write the books of the Bible, that his spirit told them the same song or their part in the song, and they wrote it out according to their own abilities uh, and you know, their own skills and their own background. And so they, each of the books of the Bible might sound a little bit different in sort of its musical notes, but it has the same melody, the same truth. And if I can take this a metaphor of music just a bit further, I think the, the Bible can be compared to a symphony played by an orchestra where you have all of the different writers of the books of the Bible where when you even though they each sound a bit different they each have their own part in it when you put them all together it just makes a, a gorgeous melody you have, you have themes that that come up and go away and then return again and everything complements themselves very very well uh, and, and the beautiful thing about the sort of the Old Testament and the New Testament, which are really the, the old Hebrew scriptures and then the new Christian scriptures, is that when you put them, take them together, they don't contrast at all. Uh, but in fact, the, the, the new additions from the, the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, actually draw out some of sort of the hidden melodies and nuances um, and harmonies that you would have found in the Old Testament. And what, it, what ha that does is that is a testimony to the fact that all of these books in, that we have in the Bible now were written by the same composer, which is the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, working through the individuals that actually wrote them. And what I really like about this, this metaphor is that it also implies that if, just as in a, an orchestra, if someone, a musician, were given the wrong piece of music to something different, and they started playing that, it's going to be very obvious very quickly that that person is not playing something that fits with the rest of the, of the symphony. And they might be either given a new piece of music or asked politely to go somewhere else because they don't belong in that orchestra. They're not playing the same symphony. And that is really useful in 
thinking about how we came to have the collection of books that we now have that we call the Bible. That the ones that we have do fit together beautifully and they tell the same story about the same loving God. And there have been, but there have been other works, um, other writings that would have claimed to be scripture or that people might have thought should be included with scripture, but they're not. And that's because they don't play nicely with um, the other books that are in there. Either they say something completely different, they're playing a different tune in a different time, and it just doesn't work. Or there could be some things that are very, very well written. Um, they seems like it goes along with the melody, but it's a bit extraneous. It's not needed. It's something extra. Sort of like all the extra books that you can read about Middle Earth. But specifically, I want to talk today about the, the Old Testament. There are 39 books in the Old Testament, and what's really striking is that the books that we have today in our Old Testament are exactly the same writings that the Hebrew people, uh, the Jews, had as their scripture at the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago. So when you read the Old Testament today, you are reading the Hebrew scripture that Jesus read and taught from and memorized and expected his hearers to be familiar with. There's no difference. Um, one minor difference is, very minor, is just that they counted the books differently. As I said, we have uh, 39 now. Uh, the Jewish people considered that they had either 22 or 24 books, not because there were fewer writings, but they lumped some of them together. For example, 1 and 2 Samuel would be one book in the Hebrew Bible, and also all the minor prophets would have been uh, lumped together as one book. And as I mentioned um, in my series where I talked about who wrote the different books, Ezra and Nehemiah actually were considered one book uh, for a very long time. Now, the great thing about knowing that we have the same Hebrew scriptures that Jesus had is it assures us that over the past 2,000 years, Christians haven't either, you know, with good intentions or bad, they haven't gone in and cherry-picked which Old Testament scriptures they want to include in the Bible. Sort of the entire Hebrew scripture was taken in, in one lump uh, and, and dropped right into our Christian scripture because they recognized that all of it was inspired by God. As Paul said, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful in teaching and training. But it is difficult because, because all of these books were already chosen as the Hebrew scripture more than 2,000 years ago. It's really difficult or impossible to be able to determine who chose them? Who decided that these books are the scriptures? These books are canonical. They're part of the canon. And as interesting as it might be for us to know who the individual people were who might have made that choice, I actually don't think it is. First of all, it's not important at all for us to know but I also don't think you could ever point specifically to here's a person or here's a small group of people who made this choice. And the reason is because I believe absolutely that there is just one person who chose all the books that are in the Bible. And that person is God himself. Not just through inspiring people to write the scriptures, but also enabling those scriptures to be preserved for hundreds and thousands of years so that we can read them today. But even more than that, I believe that it is, well, I believe, first of all, that God 
speaks to us through his Holy Scripture. And I believe that because he speaks to us, he speaks to me, he'll speak to you if you look for him, he speaks to anyone who truly seeks him through the books in this Bible. That because he's communicated for thousands of years with people through these writings, that people have known that, people have felt that, people have seen in their own lives that for some reason these writings have drawn them closer to God and so they've clung onto them and they've shared them, wanting other people to have the opportunity to grow closer to God through these writings. And that, this is sort of a side note for me right now, but it's really, really important that reading the scripture should be something that we get excited about. I know for most of my life as a Christian, like embarrassingly long amount of time in my life as a Christian, I saw reading the Bible as, as a chore, something that I knew that I should do. I really should do a little bit more and more often, but never really got around to it. But I really have found in, in recent years, as I have, uh, on the one hand, had to learn more and more uh, from the studies that I've been doing, I've also found myself desiring to read more and more, wishing that I had more time to just sit and read the scriptures and do nothing else, um, making time to sit and read the scriptures and do nothing else, because I have felt myself growing closer and closer to God through his scriptures. And I know that you and anyone else that, that really seeks God will find him, will go, grow closer to him in the scriptures. It's not a chore. It's spending time with a loved one, getting to know someone who cares about you deeply. So that's, that's my aside for right now. Um, but just get back to so God putting together the books in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. That God did in his people exactly what I'm describing to you now. That he revealed himself to people that really sought him in the Scriptures. They read them and they knew that God was speaking to them through these writings. And so they took them and they preserved them and they copied them and they passed them on to their children and to their children's children. And literally, uh, many of the Hebrews would uh, write them on the doorpost of their home. They would put them in little phylacteries, little boxes to put on their wrist or on their forehead so that the word of God would be close to them. But it, it's really, really important to keep in mind that not every Hebrew writing not every book that was written by an Israelite that believed in God became scripture. That just in the Bible, there are plenty of writings that are referred to that are not in our Bibles today. You've got um, a history referred to in, say, in Joshua. Another history written called the Book of Jasher. There's also the Book of the Wars of the Lord was a chronicle that somebody put together. We don't have that anymore. That's not in our Bible. Also, the, the book of Kings refers often to the book of the annals of the kings of Judah and annals of the kings of Israel. Um, we don't have those. Even some of some really, really well-known prophets wrote works that are not preserved as scripture. That um, we know from other parts of the Bible that there was a recorded writing of the words of Nathan, the prophet. Uh, we know that Isaiah wrote a book about the reign of King Uzziah. Jeremiah the prophet wrote a lament for Josiah when King Josiah died. And these are most certainly godly writings written by godly men. But that doesn't, does not mean that God intended those writings to be scripture. Because if he had, we would have them today. They would be in our Bible today. God inspired certain men to write certain texts which together make up this symphony of his love for us. But he only used certain people to do this. And when he revealed himself, he did it in a special way. In a way that plays this 
this tune, this orchestra tune, as I was saying, and he didn't put anything in it that would contradict the theme and the melody of the of the symphony. There is sometimes you might come across a passage that seems to have some dissonance, but even the, even a really well written uh, symphony will purposefully have some dissonance in it because it makes you pay attention to sit up and wonder what is that about? Why did the composer put that in there? But you find as the symphony goes on that it, it works its way into the main theme. But also, as a composer, God didn't put anything extra in. Only what we need, which is why something like uh, this lament of Jeremiah, it would have been beautiful, I'd be very interested in reading what it was, it wasn't necessary for God to share the story of his love with all the world throughout human history, so it wasn't included in the scripture. People didn't read it and feel drawn to God the way they did when they read Jeremiah's prophecies, for example. And that's why I, I brought out the sort of these uh, books by Tolkien at the beginning, to make the point that the Bible is like this, or rather these three books are sort of like the Bible, and that this is all that we need to know the stories of Middle-earth. Likewise, this is all we need to know the story of God's love for us, and his redemption that he offers to us. That God could have jam-packed the Bible with all sorts of other things written by godly people that told the history of his people, that told other acts of his love, but it would have been too much. He only included in the Bible the things that he needed to. We don't know why and when certain things need to be in there, but at some point in history, in some culture, there are going to be times that are relevant for everything that is included in this book. It's all intended for us, but it's all not intended specifically for us, if that makes sense. There may be things that stand out to you that really draw you to God from the, the Bible or make God's love for you more apparent, which someone in another culture is not going to respond to at all, but there may be something that seems strange to you or even... Uh, confusing or boring, which is really going to stand out to someone in another culture, in another time, maybe in the past, maybe in the future, maybe in another part of the world. And God has always known exactly what was needed to be relevant to everyone at all times, at all places. And that is why he put together the books that we have in the scripture. And I do want to just read, finally, um, I want to read something to you that was written by a man named Josephus. Now, if you're not familiar with Josephus, he was a Jewish historian. He wrote um, his histories around 90 AD. And even though he was, for the most part, a secular writer, because he was Jewish, he, he believed in God. He had an opinion about the Hebrew Scriptures. And he actually talks about how um, Moses had written the first five books of the Bible, which we've talked about. Um, but then he goes on and says that, but at the time of the death of Moses, until the reign of Artaxerxes, who were after Moses, wrote down what was done in their times. Uh, and then he talks about there being other books which are hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. He says, it is true, our history has been written since Artaxerxes, very particularly, but has not been esteemed as the, of the like authority with the former writings by our forefathers, because there has not been an exact succession of prophets since that time. Now, let me put that to you in plain English. Basically, he's saying that, yes, since the time of the, the exile ending um, under Artaxerxes in Persia, from that time until now, 500 years later when he was writing it, we've written the history of the Jewish people. 
We've written things down. People have, have written all sorts of things. But not a single one of these books has been included in our scripture, has been regarded as scripture, because the line of prophets ended at the time of Artaxerxes. And so, and this to me reinforces this idea that I was sharing with you, that the Hebrew people, they read things such as the writings of Daniel, who was in exile in Persia, um, the writings of, of Malachi, who's really the last Old Testament prophet, and they see that, yes, this is inspired by God. This fits in with the symphony of, uh, of Scripture. And so they regarded them as being of God. But every other thing that was written after that, it didn't have the same feel of authenticity. It didn't, it might have been good writing, it might have been useful to read, it might have been helpful, but they didn't hear God's melody, God's symphony in it. And so it wasn't included in the list of scriptures. And so what we have inherited as Christians is exactly the, the list of books that, um, that Jesus had and which Jesus testified to. It's really, really striking that almost every single one of the 39 books in the Old Testament is directly quoted from or referred to by Jesus or his apostles somewhere in the New Testament, except for four of them. Only Ruth, Ezra, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon are not referred to specifically. But as I said, there are, um, Jesus referred to all of the scripture as, as prophesying his life. As he explained to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he went through all the scriptures and pointed out how they had told about him. And as Paul wrote, all scripture is God-breathed, is inspired, is useful to us. So it may not be the it may not be the answer that a lot of you were looking for, but my answer to the question of who put together the books of the Old Testament is that God did. And really, that's I don't think I said it quite as explicitly in the other video, but that's the same answer to the question of who put together the books of the New Testament. God did it through a, not only inspiring people to write them, but making sure that those documents were preserved by inspiring people to, to copy them and to pass them on, by inspiring people, filling them with the Spirit, with the knowledge of God as they read them, so that they desired to copy them and to share them and to pass them on to other people. And so for that reason, that this collection of books was specifically put together by God for you, is the, the strongest reason I can give to you why you should explore it. See what it is that God wants to say to you. Listen to the music of his symphony and let it speak to you. And just dive into the richness of it. Thank you for joining me uh, today. We'll be back next week where we look a little bit more about the Bible.